to our Lord and Savior, Jesus Christ, God's grace, mercy, and peace are with all of you. Amen. Dear brothers and sisters in Christ our Lord, my grandpa had a joke that he played on my grandma for all of the 50 plus years that they were married. You would think after all of those years, grandma would catch on and not bite. But she did every single time. When all the family would get together, Grandpa would wait for a, a lull in the conversation, a quiet moment. He would make sure that Grandma was near and that she could hear. And with a twinkle in his eye and a smile on his face, he'd say in a philosophical voice, I wonder what the poor people are doing today. Every single time she would bite and say, Bernie, we are the poor people. <laughs> Grandpa wasn't a rich man financially. He worked in a warehouse for the Red Owl grocery chain. And while Grandma always thought Grandpa was talking about money, and certainly his joke hints toward money, Grandpa knew that there was more to being rich than having money. He had a different idea about what it meant to live the good life. It wasn't about having all sorts of money and throwing it around and being able to enjoy all the, the fine parts of life. To my grandpa, living a good life meant being together with family and enjoying that time together. Grandpa could enjoy his life and all the things that God had given him and find joy in life without having of money. I guess you'd say Grandpa had a little bit different idea about life and money than what many other people have. To him, money wasn't the focus or the goal. To him, he would use whatever God had given him, whether a little or a lot, to support his family and enjoy the time together. To him, money wasn't the master, it was the servant. Today, as we bring this spiritual emphasis of building our faith, family, future focus to a close, God in His Word is, is asking us to have a, a different perspective on life and money that, than what many people in the world around us might have. Especially on this Transfiguration Sunday, as we have that opportunity to catch a glimpse of the full glory that is Jesus as God and Savior and Lord, it reminds us that this world, this life, isn't the be-all and the end-all. Living the good life doesn't mean enjoying life here and forgetting about what is to come. Living the good life means living as God's redeemed people, people who are focused on eternity and are focused on using what God has given us to serve and glorify Him here on this earth. So let's sit back and listen today as God encourages us, live for eternity. We'll keep that thought in mind as we turn to our sermon text. It's from 1 Timothy chapter 6, verses 17 to 19. <coughs> Command those who are rich in this present world not to be arrogant, in order to put their hope in wealth, which is so uncertain, but to put their hope in God, who richly provides us with everything for our enjoyment. Command them to do good, to be rich in good deeds, to be generous and willing to share. In this way, they will lay up treasure for themselves as a firm foundation for the coming age, so that they may take hold of the life that is truly love. So far the words of our text. Now when we hear Paul begin this section by addressing those who are rich in this present age, we might be tempted, like my grandma, to assume he must not be talking to us. I mean, I would guess most of us wouldn't consider ourselves to be rich people. But perhaps that's because we spend most of our time focusing on what we don't have 
rather than on what we do have. We spend so much of our attention focusing on the riches of this world and losing sight of the riches that are ours as God's people to come in the next world. We like to compare ourselves to others. And when we compare ourselves and what we have to others and what they have, we allow ourselves to think that we're not really that rich of people. But I think if we do a little bit of analysis, we might find our conclusion to be a bit different. For instance, how many of you had to sweep the dirt floor, not dirty floor, the dirt floor of your house or apartment before you came to worship this morning? Maybe we don't think that there are a lot of people in our world today who still have nothing but the earth that serves as the floor in the house that they live in. Or how many of you had the rain dripping through your thatched roof or your, your roof of palm branches as the rainstorms came through this past week? Again, a lot of people around our world today still have as the only roof over their heads thatch or, or palm branches to protect them from the elements. How come it seems we never compare ourselves to those people who have less than us. We always compare ourselves to those who have more and lament about what we don't have. Or maybe think about it this way. What if, what if you had lived a hundred years ago? Or if God had placed you in this world two hundred years ago? How much different and more difficult would life have been for you? I mean, compare what we have today compared to what we have would have had back then. I mean, 200 years ago, no electricity, no cars to get around with, no jobs to go to. You have to fend for yourself. You've got to provide your own clothing and food and protection. Think about the, the medical advances that have taken place over the last 200 years. And yet still we try to consider ourselves poor. The facts tell us that the poorest of Americans are still richer than 70% of the rest of the world. Those things that you and I consider necessities in life, you know, things like cable or satellite TV, a microwave, a car for each driver, a cell phone for each person, going out to eat a couple times a week, cruises, airline tickets, all of those were considered outlandish luxuries just two generations ago. Yet we consider them necessities and wonder how we would ever do without them in our life. I think it's time for us to stop feeling sorry for ourselves. We're not really poor people. God's talking to us when he says command those who are rich in this present age. I think the difficulty comes because we too often view this world as our home and think about heaven and eternity as an afterthought. We spend all of our, our focus on, on, on trying to live life here and think about heaven as just being too far away. As we think about our building our faith family future emphasis, we find that one of the greatest barriers to joyful generosity is that whole illusion that this earth is our home. Yet God throughout Scripture tells us something much different. God calls us pilgrims, aliens, strangers here on this earth. He tells us in Scripture that like nomads, we are just journeying through this earth toward our permanent home, which is in heaven. Right? We, we sing that song, I am but a stranger here, heaven is my home. But really nothing more than ambassadors for our true country, where our citizenship is in heaven. That means God doesn't want us living for the here and now. God wants us living for eternity. And so it is as his people whom he redeemed through the blood of Jesus, to whom he has given eternity, 
who are looking forward to that eternity that comes, that he now offers these commands to those who are rich. Don't become arrogant because of your wealth. Don't put your hope in your wealth. Rather, put your hope in God, who has so richly provided everything that you need, so that you can live a life that is truly life. Maybe we, maybe we need to define what that is. What, what's life that's truly life? That really means living as God's redeemed people who look forward to the heaven that is waiting and who seek to use all that God has given us to His glory as we journey toward that home. It means living your life awake to God and full of peace and contentment with the eternal relationship He has established with you through Jesus. It means living your life with the purpose of serving and glorifying God in all that you do. It means using your riches to invest in that eternal relationship He has given to you through faith in Jesus, your Savior. You notice, Paul never condemns anyone who's rich. He never denounces anyone whom God has chosen to bless with riches. He doesn't even say that you should give it all away. He simply offers instruction for how we can use it for the best of our enjoyment. And our true joy comes from being generous with what God has to store up for ourselves and others that which is solid and sure. True joy for us as God's people is using what He has given us to, to invest in something that will last. And friends, what will last is the relationship God has given you in Jesus. That's what's going to last as you face the challenges that life will bring. That's what's going to last as you have to go and endure suffering and, and troubles here on this earth. That's what's going to last no matter what it is you have to face. Right? This is the trust that God has given to us as His people, that Paul encouraged Timothy and us to, to guard and to hold on to. That good news of forgiveness and life through Jesus' life, death, and resurrection. That is what is going to last for eternity. And again, it's, it's because of that eternity God's given to us in Jesus. Because that eternity is waiting for us, that we can use our blessings that God has given here to, to bring benefit to others. Now, it's okay for us to find enjoyment in the blessings God gives us. He, scripture tells us he, he gives them to us for our enjoyment. But the best enjoyment we can derive from those blessings is using them to help others invest in something that will last beyond this life into eternity. See, God wants us simply to remember who we are who He has made us, and the mission that He has laid out before us as His people. To reach out into this world and proclaim God's Word to the lost. To seek and to save the lost with the precious message of Jesus our Savior. And it's with to, to us who are, are focused on living to God's glory, who are, are living for eternity, storing up treasures for eternal life that God now says, command them to do good. To be rich in good deeds. To be generous and willing to share. Right, the fancy word that we use for this is stewardship. <laughs> I guess we don't use that word too much outside of the church, but stewardship simply means managing the blessings that God has given us according to His purposes. I've heard different people say it different ways. Some have said managing, it's God's people managing God's money for God's things. Or managing God's blessings, God's way, for God's glory. However you want to say it. What God wants from you and me is to be as generous with our blessings and to give to others as He has given to us. Maybe we, we see that in no better place than on this Transfiguration Sunday. 
As we see that glimpse of Jesus' glory, we're reminded He's eternal, almighty God, who even though all the power and glory was His in heaven, He was willing to give that up, to set it aside for a time, so that He could come down to this earth to live as you and me. To suffer what we deserve. To eventually die and even suffer the, the death of hell so that you and I can live with Him forever. As He in His grace has given to us the gift of eternal life, He wants us now to, to reflect that. And to give of ourselves. He wants us to be rich in good deeds. To excel as we use all that God has given us. Because that's just what faith does. It isn't to earn heaven. It's just what faith does. It, it shares. It helps. It gives unselfishly. It displays who we are. Heirs of heaven. People who are focused on eternity. By practicing that gift of sharing and generosity and in helping with the spiritual needs of others, Paul says we are storing up a treasure on a foundation that is firm and sure. Really what we're doing is investing in God's eternal kingdom. Now sometimes we have a hard time with, with giving generously because we're just focused on the concept of giving. Let's step back just a little bit. Let's, let's, let's take a little bit bigger picture look at things. Let's think about eternity. Let's think about God's eternal building project. When, when you and I are invested in something, when we are immersed in a cause, we are, are willing to give our time to it, give our money to it, to invest in it. When we think about God's eternal mission that He has given to us, and when you and I as His people are immersed in that cause, the rest of it will follow. And when we use what God has given us to invest in that eternal building project, which is the building of His kingdom through the, the preaching and the teaching of His Word, then you and I are investing in eternity. We're investing in an eternal building project. Just think about the kind of dividends that type of project can bring. It brings eternal dividends because we're working with souls. We're building others up in their faith. Think of those, those children that were before us today. And how we, through the, the ministry of our school, had the opportunity to, to build up those children in faith. To set them on that path toward eternal life that God has won and given to them in Jesus our Savior. That's where we find our true joy as God's people. And generously using what He has given to us to share with others something that will last beyond this life. Friends, if our wealth only ministers to our own pride or is used only for our own self, it will eventually lead to our ruin. Because it will impoverish our soul. But if we use our riches and all that we have to help others in their eternal spiritual welfare, we have joy that will be beyond belief. Jesus himself said it's much better to give than to receive. That, that joyful generosity just displays the spiritual wealth built up inside of you. Doing good, being rich in good deeds, generous and, and willing to share is really just a joyful expression of a faith that thanks God for all that God has done for us. When we seek as our main pursuit in life to build up our faith in Jesus our Savior and to do what we can to build others, the rest of us will naturally follow this well. You don't have to wonder what the poor people are doing. You don't have to worry about what the rich are doing with theirs. You don't have to be concerned with what you have or what you don't have. God simply wants you to, re to remember 
who you are in Him. The eternity that He has given you in Jesus and the mission that He has laid before us as His people to proclaim His word to our world and to reach the lost for Him. As you ponder that, then simply let the rest of you follow. Then use what God has given you to invest in your eternity and to help others invest in theirs. Bring glory and honor to your Savior Jesus, who in His grace has given so much to you by going out and living a, a focused life, a life that's focused on eternity. Amen. Please stay. And may the peace of God which passes understanding keep your hearts and minds in Christ Jesus our Lord. Amen. We now have opportunity to make confession of our faith. We do that using the words of the Apostles' Creed. It's on page 10 in your worship book. I believe in God, the Father Almighty, maker of heaven and earth. I believe in Jesus Christ, His only Son, our Lord, who was conceived by the Holy Spirit, born of the Virgin Mary, suffered under Pontius Pilate, was crucified, died, and was buried. He descended into hell. The third day he rose again from the dead. He ascended into heaven and is seated at the right hand of God and the Father Almighty. From there he will come to judge the living and the dead. I believe in the Holy Spirit, the Holy Christian Church, the communion of saints, the forgiveness of sins, the resurrection of the body, and the life that may be seated. We continue our worship now as we gather our offerings. We're going to ask that you please take a moment during the offerings to fill out the friendship hat. It's the black book on the inside of the pews. Once you have um, filled that out, please pass it to those who are worshiping us today. We worship the Lord with our gifts.